Very well. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll get started. Uh, so welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Sue Riddlestone. I'm Chief Executive and uh, Co-Founder of Bioregional. And uh, we I'll be chairing the session uh, and uh, welcoming our guests, Annabel McGuinness from the city of Fremantle and Phil Donaldson from Bioregional Australia. So uh, this webinar uh, will showcase, oh, wait a moment there, a few more people coming in. This webinar will showcase uh, some visionary One Planet Living leaders who are using the One Planet Living framework to create some of the world's most sustainable communities. Uh, so you're going to learn how One Planet Living leaders around the world are creating these exemplar communities that embed regenerative sustainability into people's daily lives. And you're going to hear how placemakers can use One Planet Living and how, how you can achieve recognition as a One Planet Living leader. So uh, if you could just move us on to the agenda, James. James is our tech for the day. Uh, I'm not sure what time it is for you, but uh, we've got there the uh, Greenwich Mean Time and uh, Australia Central Time in terms of the agenda. We've actually got 90 minutes. Uh, but as we clip through, uh, if, we, if we get finished earlier, then great. But if we're having a good old chat, there'll be lots of opportunity for you, as you can see there, for uh, question and answers and discussions. So do pop your questions in the chat. Uh, so I'll start off with an introduction to Bioregional and One Planet Living. Uh, so Bioregional is a charity, a social enterprise. Uh, we've been going for 28 years now. And uh, we work with partners to create places, products and services which help people to live happy, healthy lives within the natural limits of our planet, leaving space for wildlife and wilderness. And that's that's what we call One Planet Living. So it's both a vision and a framework. It's what we all need to do. And next one for me. Thanks. Uh, we work with uh, all sorts of people uh, in the UK and internationally. So um, from retailers like uh, B&Q, which is kind of like Home Depot or what do they call it in Australia? Bill, what do they call it in Australia? That sort of shop, Bund, something like that? Bunnings? Bunnings, that's it. <laughs> kind of like Bunnings. So we do work with retailers uh, as well as with places. Uh, so with local governments, um, Homes England, which is a government agency, uh, and um, with a lot of developers, including Landsec, uh, Crest, Legal and General, um, and so on. So uh, next slide, please. So the approach that we take is very much that, you know, our mission at Bioregional and our mission for all of us today on this webinar, I think, is you can see here the ecological footprint where um, you can see that line there, which the green dotted line would be a sort of sustainable level of consumption um, but we're consuming too much uh, and you can see <clears throat> in purple the <clears throat> purpley blue the carbon so a lot of that is carbon and so the ecological footprint takes into account carbon but also uh, the land use the resources that we consume so it's no good just tackling carbon we have to tackle all of our consumption <clears throat> and that's <clears throat> now at unsustainable levels of um, coming up for 70% above what the planet can absorb or sustain or regenerate. Next slide, please. And you can see that uh, different countries are consuming at different rates. So um, if we can see Australia there. Yeah, it's Australia and the UK are right up there. So if everyone lived like the average Australian, we'd need coming up for four planets uh, to support us. Uh, in the UK and Europe, it's uh, three planet living. Um, probably in Australia, I think it's to do with the the, the countries very sort of sprawled out across a huge um, country, and so there's a quite a lot of flying and travel needed, um, and quite a lot of reliance on fossil fuels. Next slide, please. And of course, many countries don't have enough. Many people are living without, and it's the richest those of us on this call probably who are creating the carbon emissions. And if we could all stop. Uh, that would really help everyone out who's trying to develop and grow. And something that can give us kind of power and agency over what to do uh, is to look at where our ecological footprint, how it breaks down into what we consume. 
So a big part of that, and this, this is a UK figure, so you can see that 25% is housing, 22% transport, 18% food, 12% all the consumer goods we buy, so the iPad, the TVs, the cars, 7%, uh, 13% uh, and 3% are kind of those, you sort of lump them together, the private services, the public services, the capital investment. That would be the sort of shared services that we all need, and so it gets lumped onto our footprint. So our goal has to be one planet living where we've become more resource efficient and we're using um, renewable energy so that we can actually get to a one planet level. And I have managed to get to 1.1 planets myself um, living here at Bedstead in London, as I do. Uh, next slide, please. So um, One Planet Living really came out of our work on Bedstead where we um, people came to us afterwards and said this is so it's an eco village of 100 homes uh, and workspace in London. And people came to us afterwards uh, and when we built it and said, wow, can we have a bed set? So we uh, systematised the approaches that we took um, with, with bed set, but also with our work on products uh, with people like Bunnings and BQ, um, and uh, turned that into a framework of 10 easy to understand principles covering all aspects of sustainability. And so the leaders that you're going to hear from will have made a plan based on these 10 principles and that concept of how can we actually get to a sustainable ecological footprint? And as I said, from my own experience, we can do it, it can work. And actually I've got a really great quality of life. So um, going from the top there, um, we need to think about health and happiness, equity in the local economy, the culture and community. And that's as much about the local culture as it is about creating a culture of sustainability. The land, how we use land, are we making a home for nature? Uh, how, how is water being used, but also managed in the landscape? Can't manage without water. Uh, local and sustainable food. Food's a big part of our footprint, as you saw there. Uh, travel and transport. We use as much energy traveling as we do heat, heating and powering our homes. The materials and products. So that's much more the circular economy. What are we, what are we consuming? What are we uh, building our homes out of? Uh, what, what are the products that we're buying and consuming? And then obviously zero waste, there shouldn't be any such thing as waste. And zero carbon energy, we can't actually achieve one planet living without going zero carbon. And indeed, the whole world needs to halve carbon emissions by 2030 if we're going to stay below 1.5 degrees and uh, dangerous levels of global warming or climate change. So um, the idea is that you would use this framework uh, and create an action plan uh, for your project, or um, you can use it for your life. Uh, you could use it for you know, where you're already up and running. So for a new build community, it's probably easier because you're starting from scratch. And we're going to hear from Annabelle about how you can use it in a local authority area where you're thinking about these principles when there's already a lot of strategies and things up and running. And uh, for, for us at Bioregional, we really like to showcase those amazing uh, projects and work and initiatives because it's really important to give people that apart from it's really important to do it for ourselves it's really important to leverage that so that we can bring about change in the relative industries and with governments to show them that it can be done and to prove the business case for it and so we really like to highlight those that are going the extra mile uh, as a one planet living leader so today you're going to hear about uh, two leaders um, uh, and how, how you can actually go about that yourself. Next slide, please. So, oh, there you are. I've gone through it too quickly. <laughs> so you can see a little bit more there about the sort of subheadings of the 10 principles. So um, we often find that health and happiness is a real outcome of all the other principles. One thing that we found living here, I find living here at Bedstead when we surveyed uh, the residents is that we built a sustainable community and we've reduced the dominance of cars in the landscape and it's more about people and place making. And so people here report a very um, high quality of life that they know meant more of their neighbours than people over the road. So health and happiness uh, and a good life is a real outcome and that also helps with um, sales of such communities because when you go and visit one 
you really know, uh, oh, this feels a bit different. I really like it. So um, we find that they could sell quite quickly as well. So next slide, please. So um, here you can see a few of the leaders and we're going to, as I say, we're going to hear from two of them today. Um, one, I, one I really like, uh, Gérard Bremont, uh, Village Nature Paris, uh, came to visit us soon after Bed said he read about it in a magazine and he was one of those people that said, can you help me to do? He, he creates sustainable holiday resorts. And so there's a huge, um, I think something like 10,000 uh, centre parks, holiday resort near Paris, uh, near Disneyland Paris, um, which is uh, has amazing things like um, a geothermal bore to heat the swimming pool. Um, and you have all the water slides and, and everything that you'd expect on such a holiday. It's all electric, so there's no noisy grass trimmers. Um, nature is abundant because it's all been planted up to and increased biodiversity massively. So that's that's an example. And we're going to hear uh, more today about uh, some of the Australian projects. And later on uh, this, uh, this afternoon for us in the UK, uh, you can hear about uh, projects in Ottawa, in Canada um, and uh, the UK. So um, next slide. Oh, so it's the gold standard and there are 24 leaders at the moment. So now I'd like to introduce uh, Annabelle McGuinness who um, has worked at the City of Fremantle as Senior Project Officer for Sustainability for five years. And Annabelle's role is uh, she's responsible for all aspects of sustainability planning and management, including the annual progress reporting for the city's One Planet Action Plan. So Annabelle, over to you. People want to hear how it's done and what you've done and be inspired. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for the introduction and the invitation to speak about our One Planet journey. Uh, first, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the city of Fremantle, some of our One Planet success stories, and then I'll give you some information on why we love One Planet. Next slide, please. So we are located in WA, where that uh, small red dot down below. So WA's claim to fame at the moment, you might have heard of us because we're one of the last places in the world to get COVID. It's just starting to creep in now. Uh, but there are 139 local governments in WA and we are one of the 38 in metropolitan Perth. So on the right hand side, you can see our um, boundaries in red. We're about 19 kilometres squared and we have about 31,000 people living here. So although we are small, we are very lucky to have um, the beaches and the river at our doorstep. Next slide, please. So I've just put a few uh, pictures here to give you a bit of a sense of place. Uh, Fremantle is a bit of a tourist city and we do have a big arts and culture community. We have a um, the International Arts Festival here every year. And we do have a big cafe and pub culture as well. We're also very lucky in that we have some of the oldest heritage buildings in WA, um, such as the oldest building, the Roundhouse, and also Fremantle um, Prison, which was built by the convicts and is on the World Heritage List. So we're mostly zoned residential. Um, sorry, next slide and industrial and in the back of this slide there you can see that we also have a large operating port. So the city of Fremantle um, became a one planet city in 2014 and we received international certification in 2015. So for us the one planet principles were in line with a lot of the projects that each team were already working on. So it was really a matter of pulling all that work together and demonstrating how the collective efforts of the city met, met the One Planet principles and then filling in gaps in any areas. So in 2020, we, sorry, still on that slide. Uh, so in 2020, we reviewed our first strategy and we prepared the uh, One Planet framework. And so this, this document outlines our new goals and we've arranged this so that it's really heavily aligned with our community strategic plan. And the action plan supports the framework and that details all the actions that we're going to do for the next five years. Next slide, please. 
So for zero carbon energy, we have a goal to maintain our carbon neutral status through to 2030, and we have been a carbon neutral city uh, since 2009. And we also have a goal that all of our buildings, parks and street lights will be powered by renewable energy by 2025. So some of our main projects is the development of Wellyellup Civic Centre, and we've literally just moved into this building about two months ago. And you might be able to tell that I've never been in this room before and I've chosen a room where the sun is like creeping in and is going to be straight in my face very soon. Uh, but while Yellow Civic Centre has 240 kilowatts of solar panels on the roof and that really maxes out the roof space. So the city of Fremantle proportion of the building is expected to be powered by 100% renewable energy over the course of the year. And the building does have a lot of other sustainability features like double glazing, uh, an energy efficient heating and cooling system, the ability to open the windows so we can have natural ventilation for a large proportion of the year energy efficient water features and new end of trip facilities. And we do have a room for a battery once they become a little bit more affordable. So in November last year, the council has also resolved to purchase green power for our contestable energy sites. So our electricity makes up 21% uh, of our carbon emissions and our contestable energy is two thirds of that, so 14%. Contestable energy in WA is anything over 50 megawatts and so anything over that you can choose your retailer. Otherwise we can't. Sorry, next slide please. Uh, so one of our goals for zero waste is that 80% of our residents have access to FOGO by 2025. So FOGO is food organics and green organics, and it means that all residents receive a third bin other than their landfill and their recycling bin. And any of your food waste or um, trees, shrubs, anything like that can go in that bin. So we've managed to reach our target already. FOGO was rolled out about, four, uh, sorry, two years ago, and it's now available to 93% of our residents and uh, it's just become available uh, to commercial entities and also schools. In the last couple of years, we've also had a recycling centre upgrade. Uh, the recycling centre has doubled in size and it now collects about 30 streams and includes a reuse store. So if anybody drops off anything um, that can, can be reused, we then sell it on for very cheap prices. And the recycling centre when it's open has about 150 visitors a day. Last year, uh, WA also introduced cash for containers, which means if you bring down your bottles, you get a um, 10 cents back or you can donate that to a charity of your choice. So this just had its one year anniversary and the city of Fremantle drop off point collected 4.1 million bottles within that time and raised $30,000 for the community. Uh, we also have a very large waste education campaign uh, and that goes throughout schools, our community information sessions, workshops and site tours. Next slide please. Moving on to materials and products. In the city of Fremantle, we have a sustainable events policy, and this means that all of our city run events, we can't use any single use plastic, styrofoam, polystyrene, balloons or confetti. Um, and there's also implications for events that are approved by the city. We've also introduced a ban on the release of helium balloons on city land. We also have a sustainable procurement procedure. So any tender, which is over $50,000, has a 10% sustainability criteria weighting. Uh, and this accounts for about over 50% of um, all of our purchasing. And now all tenders that go out are reviewed by a sustainability officer, which has improved the quality of our sustainability requests in tender documentation. Next. 
So for land and nature, we have a goal of planting 1,000 trees per year as per our annual um, targets in the urban forest plan. So in the table there, you can see that I've got um, our urban forest plan targets and the total number of trees planted. And we've managed to surpass um, our goal every year and we're hoping that this will help us towards our target of increasing our tree canopy cover to 20% by 2027. Next slide, please. So I've just included this picture here to show you some of the coastal erosion that we do have on some of our beaches. So we have prepared um, some coastal hazard risk management and adaptive planning documents for our beaches in conjunction with some of the other local councils. And as part of this, we do coastal monitoring of our beaches and rehabilitation where necessary. Next slide, please. So moving on to what we love about One Planet. So in particular, I've found that it's a very catchy, bright, bright brand, and it's very simple and easy to understand and communicate to your community. Uh, the independent feedback that you receive is um, really great. Uh, Bioregional does work with places from all around the world, so they do have um, a lot of good examples and best practice advice. I also really like the flexibility of the framework. So um, we do have sort of limited resources at the city and there is recognition that if um, we're not doing so well in one area, but we are focusing our energy on another area, there is recognition of that. I also really like having the compilation of the information in all one document rather than um, having uh, sort of information on what you're doing for waste and carbon all in different documents, but it's good to have it in the one location and then that's some, some it's a document that you can share with the community. Also having doing the annual reporting keeps you motivated and uh, it shows where you are progressing in areas and in areas that you're not progressing. Next slide, please. So if there are any other local governments out there that are listening, um, if you're thinking about One Planet Living, uh, some of the things I would recommend is having your data um, under control. If you can get um, your data for your indicators in order, like have something that you know that you're going to be able to monitor every year, um, if you have that in order at the beginning, that's um, great and that will save you a lot of time. Organisation-wide input is definitely required. You can't just have one person working on it. Uh, and we have a team called the One Planet Champions and that's um, people from all different directorates and we meet up four times a year. And um, that that's really helpful in um, when it goes to annual reporting time, you've got existing relationships with those people. And I also think it's really good to ensure alignment with your strategic community plans and, and your other action plans, because then it, um, it's definitely easier to get the support of councillors and other officers. So that's it from me. Um, if you've got any questions, please let me know. Thanks, Annabelle. Thanks, that's Annabelle. very inspiring. Very inspiring. Uh, and, uh, one thing I noticed, I've got a bit of feedback there, I don't know if everyone else can hear that. Uh, one thing I noticed was um, that you're very much working with existing systems where you can to sort of weave it in there. And the importance, you know, for example, the procurement, which we found is huge, you know, a huge part of what a local government can can do is through procurement. Um, and, my, and about the people, you know, having the champions, having it fit in with existing plans and systems and meeting regularly. So. I noticed some similarities across other local governments, local cities, cities that we work with. Um, but there are some questions in the chat. Um, I don't know if the people themselves would like to ask them or I'm not sure if that's possible, tech team, or shall I go ahead and read out the questions here? We've uh, got a few in there for you. People very interested, Andrew from Telford Homes, asking what percentage of offsets are being applied to the quality and the quality of the offsets, what certification standards are you using? And another person is um, 
uh, and a bit, a bit more information um, about the abbreviations. So what's a WA and what's contestable energy? So I think that's also linked. Um, and maybe and the other one is, you know, what tools are you using to measure and report your carbon? So they're, they're there in the chat, Annabelle, but um, they're also linked to measuring carbon and, and how you're handling the zero carbon approach. So if you could elaborate on that, that would be great. Oh, I need to unmute you. Sorry, you're on mute at the moment. Annabelle, Annabelle are you able to unmute yourself? Sorry. Sorry, I was chatting away there. You clearly couldn't hear me. <laughs> Um, so the offsets that we use, uh, it's an international certification process. I'm, I'm not actually the one that does our offsets myself, um, but we're, and then we purchase either it's um, they're called uh, biodiverse revegetation offsets in WA, and it's a um, it's a project that revegetates an area in um, the northwest wheat belt of WA and um, if you have a look at some of the pictures, they've revegetated the areas and they've got native fauna species coming back into that area as well. Uh, and then um, because we do have a limited budget, we split it between getting those offsets and then we get um, international offsets that are certified. Uh, next question. Um, um, WA is Western Australia, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, so the contestable energy, so uh, in Western Australia uh, for a lot, so most residents, well all residents really, you don't have choice over who your retailer is, but big, um, because we're a, uh, a large council, some of our areas use over 50 megawatts of energy per year and then that's a contestable site. And if you're at a contestable site, you can choose your retailer. So yeah, that's what that is. Um. Thanks, Annabelle. There's there's another question in there. Um, what guided your decision to pursue One Planet Living versus other ESG rating schemes? Yeah, so I, I wasn't around at the time that they were doing this, but my understanding is they looked at a couple of other systems. One was Planet Footprint and then there was the Millennium Development Goals. But my understanding is that um, the One Planet framework was really appealing because, because of the branding and because uh, when we looked at all the projects that we were doing, we were doing a lot of projects in each of those areas. And uh, so it was very much collating all that information and um, putting it putting it all together to see how we met the met the principles and then filling in the gaps. Yeah, and I, th I think I'd add, uh, it's not just a rating scheme, it's very much a process for action. So yeah. um, it's measuring, but it's also helping people to take action because it's easy to understand for, for my own. So I just saw you mention their rating schemes, Marnie. Mm. Um, Michael Herman is asking where you've got to with regard to average residence footprints before and now, and how far do you think it's reasonable to aim for? Is One Planet Living actually doable? And what are the obstacles to getting down to it? So we don't, uh, because we can't really control what our residents do, we don't, we don't have measures of individual, um, individual residents footprints. We have been supporting, uh, there's something called Climate Clever, which is a local Fremantle company which has developed an app which helps you calculate your carbon emissions. So they started out doing this for schools and uh, they've just um, that they, they've now their app is now available to all residents um, free of charge. Uh, so hopefully through using that app, um, we'll be able to get some more information on uh, what some of our the carbon emissions of our residents are. That's great, thanks, Annabelle. Um, and I was like, you may have missed it at the beginning, but I mentioned that here at Bedstead, it's very much enabling people 
or in the work that we found, if you enable people, it's possible for people to make those choices. So they will have a natural reduction in footprint. So we've measured at least a 10% reduction without residents doing anything um, to start with. But you can have sort of a rebound effect where if people are flying a lot, that can add to their footprint, even if you've saved energy in the home and in day to day travel, if people fly a lot, that can bump it back up again. So but you definitely have a sort of default level of reduction and wealthier people tend to have a higher footprint than people on low incomes. That's another thing we've noticed. And adding to what Annabelle said, there's the Global Footprint Network Calculator where you can, Global Footprint Network Calculator, perhaps James can put that in the chat, uh, which you can offer to residents where they can actually see how many Earths or planets they're consuming and get some ideas on, on where that arises. Sorry, Annabelle, did, did you want to come in there? No, that's OK. I did just see there's another um, question yeah. about employees we have working on the framework. Uh, so we have um, in terms of our sustainability officers, we've got myself and we also have a sustainability technical officer position, which is currently open if you're interested in um, registering for it. Um, and but then uh, with so I guess we're the only two officers specifically on sustainability, but um, because we, we definitely have officers from every directorate who um, passes on information to us. So, I mean, the number of people that I go to to get information for annual reporting would be maybe 20. Um, yeah, so there's there's a lot of people. Thanks, Annabelle. So James has just posted the footprint calculator and I'll just add to that in terms of re reporting and measuring and keeping it simple. So when we measured the county of Oxfordshire and the councils within that in the UK has adopted One Planet Living. And so when the annual review was completed, it looked for existing data sets that are reported on. And sometimes it identified there's a gap um, where data needs to be collected. But if you're using data that you do report on anyway, um, that's a good start. And also uh, the One Planet Cities um, network, um, there were four cities that reported on their footprint. So perhaps, I don't know, James, giving you a bit more work to do, if you can find that. Um, in fact, I've, I've found it, so I'll pop it in in a moment. Um, you can see how those cities um, reported and measured their residents' ecological footprint. So uh, we've come up to the next item. So uh, moving on to hear from uh, Phil Donaldson, who is the Chief Executive Leader of Bioregional Australia for two years. Phil is, and sorry, thank you very much, Annabelle, and we'll maybe bring you in later to the discussions. Um, Phil is also Director of Sustain SA and the Australian Living Lab Innovation Network, Adelaide and Green Cities Global. He is a board member of Trees for Life. Uh, he's the One Planet Living Lead Assessor and Professional in Australia and Green Building Council of Australia, Green Star Communities Assessor. And Bioregional Australia Foundation is a, a sister organisation to Bioregional uh, Development Group and um, very much its own entity with its own board. Over to you, Phil. Thanks, Sue, and uh, thanks, Annabelle, for that presentation. Um, yeah, look, I'm really pleased to be here uh, as Bioregional Australia's Chief Executive Leader. Um, as Sue said, I've been in the role for for two years now. Um, started off uh, and met my board face to face, and then COVID hit, so I've been uh, online for two years, <laughs> running an organisation and uh, and getting to know my members and and getting to know the the program. We've had we've just signed a 10 year agreement with. Um, with Bioregional, uh, with Sue and the board uh, to run um, Bioregional Australia and the One Planet Living program here in Australia, which is which is fantastic, and and it's uh, really pleasing to be here tonight. Um, next slide, please. Is that uh, just wanted to acknowledge the First Nations Australians as traditional owners of the land we meet on and pay our respects to their elders, past, present, and future. And in Adelaide, where I meet, we meet on the lands of the Kaurna Nation. Next slide, thanks. So I just wanted to talk about leading the change uh, in Australia and, and Annabelle, I, I've got to be, be really honest and say that really Fremantle has been leading the change in a lot of the work that they've been doing in Western Australia and that's influenced uh, a number of developments that uh, have got One Planet Living uh, certification um, 
in the past couple of years. Um, next, uh, next page. So our vision, uh, we support the vision of bioregional in, in that a world in which people everywhere can lead happy, healthy lives within the limits, environmental limits of our one planet. And our mission is to create pro those places, products and services which make one planet leaving easy, attractable and affordable. As our agreement with uh, bioregional is that we support the vision, um, the goals and objectives of bioregional, although you know, we do have our own strategy and our own approach, um, but we're very much hand in glove and we have a, have a conversation once a month, which is which is fantastic working with Joe um, and the team there at, uh, at Bioregional. Uh, next slide. So um, we have a we have a strategy uh, which talks about our, our vision, which is about thriving local and regional economies. Um, which enable people to live happy, healthy lives. Um, and our mission is really about creating a movement of people and communities and organisations adopting One Planet Living in Australia and our region. Next slide. We do that by working on five particular areas, talking about our community, which is about mobilising commu uh, communities in Australia and Oceania towards a, a better future, and to talk about our story, to demonstrate the value of One Planet Living. So some of the things that are being talked about tonight around stories, around the journey that people have been on, the, the process of going from thinking about One Planet Living to um, implementing and then and then getting it peer reviewed. Um, the types of programs that we offer to provide those quality products and service. The types of partnerships, so the partnerships we have with, not only with, um, with bioregional, uh, okay. Um, uh, with uh, Bioregional, but we also have partnerships with uh, a group in Australia, such as um, the Materials and Energy Low, Low Carbon Group, um, that one of our board members is, or two of our board members have been working on. Um, and we're developing partnerships, and we've got currently conversations happening with Green Building Council, um, Passive House, and uh, and B Corp, talking about what the relationship is between us, because. You know, we're after scale and speed. And then our future is really what's coming over the horizon. What are the things that we need to do to think about? And so well, climate climate change is an important thing. There's a lot of other things and carbon is is really uh, in people's um, eyesight at the moment. Um, so we'll be looking at those things uh, as well into the future. So that's the, the approach that we use. And uh, next slide, please. So just talking about our product services and membership, and the reason why I'm going through this is to give you an idea about how we operate. Um, next slide, please. Um, what we do, uh, so via regional, we, yes, we we are um, have an agreement with with Bio regional. We are our own entity, so we have our own website, website, but that links back into the Bio regional website, and we provide the education, training, and certification. Uh, in One Planet Living. Um, we look at corporate strategy development, benchmark and reporting. So just to give you an idea about that, we're actually doing a benchmarking um, exercise with a private school in Australia at the moment, um, which is starting to look a little bit like what Fremantle did, which was around looking at what they were currently doing, where it fitted in into the um, One Planet Living framework, framework, and then, you know, what's the opportunity then to develop that action plan? And, and that's really exciting for us. And I know by regional in, is uh, is working with school and a particular school and a number of schools in in a, in in the UK, and we're looking to to see how what the opportunities are to to share some of those conversations. Um, we're developing leadership courses for climate action and risk management, and then you know we're delivering events and forums. And just on just on membership, it, it um, I just want to thank the members that are here tonight. Um, I know we've got Greg Ryan from the WA Development Corporation, who's been responsible for a number of One Planet Living um, developments, working with Fremantle in uh, in Western Australia. And we've also got um, Luke Parker, who's uh, who's from OP Properties, who I'll talk about later, who's also here. And I think there's some other people, um, Valerie's here, and and other people that have been involved with Bioregional Australia. So I just wanted to recognise those people. And uh, next slide, please. So in terms of membership, we have access to national networks. So um, just as Annabelle said that she meets with her team once every you know, four, three or four months, uh, we work with our professionals uh, every, every month. Um, we work with our projects every month as a forum, an opportunity to share, share information about what's happening, what the, what the challenges are, what the options for solutions are. Um, that helps to to build a, a knowledge base and a professional base of understanding. Um, membership also provides some dis discounts to courses and the recognition process. 
And then we have general and specific training and education around One Planet Living, but also we can do bespoke uh, processes and also meet staff virtually or on site. Just an example of that, we've, uh, you know, we did a, a presentation um, to World Bank uh, for the Asia Pacific region um, for 30 of their team leaders uh, last year as a way of uh, giving them some knowledge around One Planet Living and the opportunities for cities and regions in that area, which is, you know, one of those areas that's going to be um, impacted quite strongly by uh, by climate change. Uh, then we provide some advisory support around technical um, leadership and we tailor things to particular groups. And then from a marketing perspective, we work with Bioregional on the international branding, the national branding, um, the role that we play to make sure there's consistency across the board. We haven't always got that right, but we get better at it every time. Um, and our role is to make sure that we support and uh, and reflect the brand across our region and, and around community e empowerment. Um, next slide, thanks. So training and education. So we, next slide, thanks. So we offer three, um, three, I suppose, three modules. One's about explore, a bit like this, One Planet Living Overview. We do give a little bit of an overview of One Planet Living. And then One Planet Living, we do a case study of, of global um, projects all around the world. Um, that they are going to be uh, a free seminars that we're presenting on a, on a monthly basis. The learn basis talks you into the, the actual One Planet Living action tool um, and the action plan itself. And then the implement is really about developing professionals that want to deliver online, um, sorry, want to deliver One Planet Living with clients um, in our region and talk about how they uh, can monitor and, and work with uh, programs. So I think what's really important for us is that, you know, our role is to ensure that there's a consistency and a quality of around the way that we introduce our plan, our training, pro, tra sorry, our training programs across our area, which is also consistent with the training programs that are offered by Bioregional. Um, next slide, please. So just to talk about, and uh, I suppose one thing is that's really important to understand is that One Planet Living has been around for a long time. I think uh, Sue and I, I think we met around about 2005, I think when she came to Australia, came to South Australia and, and met with our Climate Change Council with I think Tim Flannery and, and people like that. Um, so we've, we've been around in this space for a while. And I just wanted to give you some of my reflections on things that I've been involved in and the organisations been involved in. So um, if we can go to the next slide. So I'll just take you through um, two, which aren't actually One Planet Living um, projects, but they are in some ways. So Lock Hill Park is actually modelled on BedZ. It's actually modelled and benchmarked against the BedZ project, and it emphasises the idea about One Planet Living. And it developed, you know, part of that, you know, part of One Planet Living is about inspiration and innovation and creativity. And so we at Lockheed Park, when I've actually program managed this on behalf of the South Australian government for a couple of years, um, we developed the first carbon zero house in Australia. So we started to uplift, and I think that's what's really important. We can show what One Planet Living looks like. This is a, a six, 14 hectare site, four hectares is development, and 10 hectares is wetlands, urban forest and uh, and you know uh, local community facilities so it's quite it you know if you looked at bed Z and then you looked at Lock Hill Park you'd see a lot of similarities between between those two developments and and I just talk about Bowden Urban Village which was actually master planned I think one of the things that we've found uh, very strongly with One Planet Living is that it provides a really solid framework for the conversation around what does uh, you know, a sustainable community look like? What does a One Planet Living community look like? And we had Poran Desai, Desai who's a, a founder of um, Bioregional and also a co-founder co of Bioregional, sorry, because I know Sue and you, <laughs> Poran, we're co-founders co uh, of uh, Bioregional and Bedzet and then is uh, is currently involved in OnePlanet.com. Um, so it was planned entirely on, on One Planet Living principles. Um, at the time, we weren't mature enough, I think, in Australia to really go through um, the actual peer review process. We probably didn't understand it as well. So it ended up adopting uh, Green Star um, qualifications in terms of ratings. And it's considered one of the greenest um, communities in Australia in that all buildings are five star Green Star, all heritage buildings are six star Green Star, and it has a has a role to, to make sure it's actually, a, it's actually classified as a, a global Green Star community as a rated system. So, and we've done a check around what they originally said they were doing, and they've just about 
um, ticked off every box in terms of the principles related to one plan. So they've, they've kept the original planning. Up. And I think it's really important to understand that, you know, we go on a journey um, and we have been for a long time in Australia. And then uh, West Wye, we, uh, Echo Village uh, in 2012 was Australia's first endorsed one plan living led by the board um of uh led, led by some of the board members of bioregional uh and very exciting um that that was our first endorsed one planet living project next uh next slide please so and and i just want to um talking about an emerging project i mean there are lots of projects that have happened in 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 um in australia west uh, what's what's really critical has been our relationship with Fremantle. Um, the Western Australia Development Corporation and developers in Western Australia. So um, in some respects, Development WA have put land out to the market. They've put, as part of that expression of interest, they've put One Planet Living as a guideline that um, developers are bidding into that. Um, but that's reinforced by the planning system of Fremantle, which recommend that if people want their DPA to go and meet sustainability criteria, then one of the requirements is to eat to meet Green Star equivalent, One Planet Living being equivalent. So what's happened is that there's been this site in Western Australia that has been significant, and you can see the case studies on the Bioregional and Bioregional Australia website around Whitegum Valley, around Nuts, East Nutsford um, and Live Apartments which is really quite uh, exciting because Fremantle have put those planning requirements in. Um, and so just to give you an example of what that means is, and Luke, uh, Luke Parker's on the line at the moment. Um, he's, uh, he's the project I'm going to talk about. So next, next slide, please. We talk about Montreal Commons in, in Perth WA. Now, re the reason why I'm talking about this as emerging is that they're just about to give us uh, Luke, I hope I'm right. It's going to come soon. Is the is the uh, all the documentation so that they can be um, peer reviewed and uh, and we'll peer review that in Australia. Uh, we'll send our recommendations to Bioregional and uh, between us we come to an agreement about whether it's meeting national or uh, or global significance. Um, this is a really exciting project. It's in the White Gum Valley area, uh, the East Nutsford uh, village area. Um, and uh, what's I think is important about it. Next slide, please. Is you know what, what I enjoy about One Planet Living is that it provides opportunity for inspiration and innovation. So it's going to be one of the first ever carbon neutral apartment developments in Australia. Uh, would they have achieved that through any other mechanism? They may have. That may have been their aspirations. But what what One Planet Living did it was actually guide that what is aspirational about you know the uh, zero energy uh, principle that sits around One Planet Living, and the developer OP Properties and, and Luke is the now you, if you're looking at a screen it's probably the second person from the left I think the the first person from the left is Sean who's now the project manager so they're actually funding the PV and battery storage but what's important about that is it's actually um, off helping to offset their strata levies, which means this is now affordable as well as achievable, and then saving 240 tonnes of uh, carbon each year. And then um, the excess energy would be topped up with 100% um, green energy from the grid, resulting in green guilt free power. And that case study is coming out, and we've done a, a podcast on that. So look for that um, going forward. Next slide, please. So our region. Uh, is Australasia and Oceania. Um, get in contact with us if you're interested in looking at some of our projects and having a further conversation. I know there's some people online from Australia that are keen to work with councils. Um, we're keen to work with you um, to move that, to give you the pathway towards um, certification to peer review, um, that technical support and, you know, ensure that you're part of the bioregional and, and One Planet Living family, not only here in Australia, but in our region and and globally and that global link is what we have with with bioregional next slide please so thank you and uh look i really hope you enjoy the rest of the seminar today um there's lots more information about australia that uh, um, we can share but i thought my job was to actually talk about how we're going what we're doing and how we can support you in in the region that we're at so uh, enjoy the rest of the webinar thanks sue thanks everyone Thank you, Phil. Uh, great to hear about the, that good dose of inspiration there. And interesting to see how 
the local authority in Fremantle has worked together with developers uh, and also those projects in Perth. Um, I don't know if uh, Luke or Greg wanted to come in there with any comments as, as you're on online. I think maybe I'd have to unmute you, so perhaps we can't do that, but perhaps we can fit that in at the end. So um, I'll check with the technical team <laughs> and if you want to say anything. So uh, moving on now, uh, I'd like to welcome um, Lewis Knight uh, from Biregional, based here in Oxford in the UK. Um, um, <clears throat> Lewis is a programme manager for Sustainable Places here, here in the UK. Um, he's got a background in spatial planning, uh, working at the building research establishment uh, and in renewable energy. Uh, he's a bit of a social entrepreneur as a director of Bista Green, uh, which is a reuse uh, and recycling centre uh, in Oxfordshire, and also um, one of the sort of has been a driving force between Oxfordshire Green Tech, which is an amazing network um, of green companies across Oxfordshire. So, um, Lewis is going to uh, tell us about Elmsbrook. Over to you, Lewis. Thank you, Sue. Uh, morning, all, or um, or um, evening, all. Um, Yes, uh, I'm going to give you a whistle stop tour through um, Elmsbrook, uh, one of the only um, eco towns um, built in the UK. Uh, I'm just going to give a little bit of background to the scheme and then um, a little bit of detail about some of the sustainability um, initiatives that have been implemented there and how uh, One Planet Living has been the uh, driver behind setting the sustainability framework for that. Um, so next slide, please, James. So, uh, for those of you uh, that don't know where uh, Bista is, so uh, Bista is a medium sized market town just outside um, Oxford. Um, it's reportedly one of the fastest growing towns across uh, the UK. So, um, it has about 13,000 new homes planned um, um, up to uh, 2031, um, with many of those already built um, or uh, well within the planning of the process. Um, so, um, as I said, it's about 10 miles from Oxford, has really good rail links both north and south in the UK. So you can get to London in about an hour, Birmingham in an hour, but also crucially, which is quite rare um, um, in the UK, you can actually go east and west by rail as well. Um, and it was very much uh, built around this um, eco town vision that was set by the um, government in the early 2000s. And it was and um, that vision is about not just about creating new zero carbon homes, but it's about how you can uh, bring an entire um, town of existing homes and residents along with you as well. So the vision there was to make not just Northwest Bista, which is the new part of it, an eco town, but the uh, but the entirety of Bista as well. Next slide, please, James. So um, there you go. Uh, you can see uh, Bista there on the left in the 1950s, just post-war, an incredibly small market town built around um, a couple of roads and a railway. Um, and then you can see the boom there in 50 uh, years post-war um, around um, um, around the ring road um, that you can see there. And then if we fast forward, James, just one more slide. You can see here, uh, this is um, a few years old now, but this is where you can see those major developments are planned or are in the process of um, happening across Bista. And if you look at that big one there that says Bista 1, that is Northwest Bista, which is the um, eco town um, allocation. So if you just fast forward, James, just one slide, thank you. So here, just zooming in on that uh, red line for Northwest Bista, um, that is the um, that is the um, allocation for the um, eco town. That's six thousand um, homes, uh, and uh, I'm going to be touching on uh, the uh, yellow um, sort of shape that you can see there. That is what we call the um, exemplar phase, or is otherwise known by its sales name now, which is um, Elmsbrook, and that is almost complete. Um, uh, Next slide, please, James. Sorry, this little box keeps popping up. As I said, uh, this is a very old scheme in the terms of planning. Uh, there's been some big shifts in the UK um, in the planning system. So this scheme, uh, Sue was actually involved at the very, very outset about setting the vision about what an eco town should look like. And there was a very special uh, bit of documentation that you can see there, um, which was 
pretty much a checklist as to what an eco town should look like. So you can see some of the standards there. So around a definition of true zero carbon. Um, Ruth, I will definitely come on to that in a minute about um, about affordability, um, but also um, some of the other standards around water efficiency and crucially around embodied carbon. And if you think about when this was developed or when or, or when this standard came into fruition, you know, over 10 years ago, not many people in the UK were thinking around embodied carbon. So it was very, very um, innovative at its time. Unfortunately, uh, with changes of government in the UK, this standard got withdrawn, but through our sort of working relationship with the local authority, lots of these standards actually got pulled into their local plan and so um, are actually part of what sets the standard for Northwest Bicester now. But you can still find that planning policy statement online. It is a um, um, it is archived, but it does give you a really good indication um, of the true aspirations for that site. Uh, next slide, please, James. So fast forwarding 12 years on and I'm going to I've got some lovely um, images um, um, that I can show you. Where are we now? Well, Northwest Bicester is still a designated eco town. It's also got garden town status. So this is what happens when you get changes of um, government in the UK. Um, there are sort of new stamps and new labels get uh, bought out. It is also one of 10 new um, um, healthy new towns. So this is a um, NHS, so um, healthcare sponsored um, program all about. Um, Absolutely, Andrew, I can touch on that. Um, uh, it is a um, healthy new town, sorry, um, that I was mentioning. So this is a um, NHS funded program to look at how the built environment can actually improve um, the uh, physical and mental health of um, residents. Crucially, it's a portfolio of uh, townwide projects as well, so it's not just about the new development. Um, so lots of things have happened in the um, in the existing town such as insulation program, boiler replacements, um, low carbon transport initiatives, etc. So there is a master plan for that entirety of that um, red line that I showed you. That uh, yellow uh, shape, um, that is um, Elmsbrook, that is almost now complete. And there are applications in for the other, um, uh, in the um, other um, phases of uh, Northwest Bicester. <coughs> And crucially, one of the key things that have um, happened over the past year is a new rail um, underbridge that will basically unlock uh, the infrastructure um, to the um, other elements of the site. And really, One Planet Living has been used um, for um, Elmsbrook to really structure the development's response to sustainability. It provides a very strong communication tool. It also provides a strong narrative to show a truly holistic response to um, sustainability. Um, and um, it's also brought in um, about five million pounds worth of research funding because it is such a um, um, innovative scheme and such a pioneer. Um, um, uh, it has uh, brought in uh, UK uh, government funded um, projects um, around um, heat networks, around smart grids, etc. So next slide, please, James. So just touching on some of the um, key sustainability features. Here you can see some lovely um, images of the of the schemes. You can see the um, houses there at the top and at the bottom. You can see um, some aspects of the solar provision as well in the top right. So um, Elmsbrook, which is the exemplar phase, is just shy of 400 homes, has a passive house primary school on site, has an enterprise hub, and I'll touch on that in a minute, and has a local centre as well in uh, creation. And as I said, it's part of that 6,000 home uh, master plan. Um, and it was occupied um, uh, from about 2016. That's when the first residents came in. Um, it is uh, zero carbon um, in terms of the definition at the time of planning, and we can touch on that in a bit more uh, later, maybe in the in uh, some of the questions. There are PV, so photovoltaics on on every single roof, uh, and when that final home will be built, uh, that will be the largest domestic solar PV array in the UK. There's about 35 square meters of um, solar PV on average on each um, home. It has an in-house um, information system called the Shimmy, which is a bit like an iPad um, in each of the homes. It gives real time information on uh, the um, energy use, water use, heat usage, as well as providing uh, real time public transport information as well. 
So its construction has about 30% lower embodied carbon than a traditional built house in the UK. And predominantly that's through uh, the use of um, method of modern construction. So um, timber uh, structurally insulated panels um, that are used, but also some also clever uh, material considerations. So uh, recycled content um, in the in the bricks um, and uh, also in the roof tiles and things like that. Uh, next slide, please, James. Um, so, as I said, I'm not going to touch on this in too much detail, um, but um, it achieves its zero carbon status through uh, really good fabric efficiency, um, low energy lighting um, and a really good air tightness as well. So next slide, James. And yeah, as I touched on there, a really good solar provision. So you can just see the sheer amounts of solar PV um, across all of the homes and the flatted areas as well. Um, James, next slide. So some of the other um, elements, so 40% um, of um, Elmsbrook is uh, given over to green space. It has um, orchard areas as well as community growing spaces, as you can see there in the top right, if you strain your eyes a bit. Um, there's a range of uh, wildlife um, habitats and fruit trees included within the development. Um, <clears throat> and I think it's important to say that um, this scheme was a uh, built on a monocultural agriculture um, field. Um, so biodiversity value was um, relatively low. Um, so a key focus has been about retaining the key um, habitats such as the um, hedgerows, uh, some of the tree areas with really good buffer zones between them. Um, and then those um, habitats managed specifically for biodiversity. And it's and yeah, um, one of the other key elements really was around transport. So it's a relatively suburban area. So there's a strong reliance upon the private vehicle. So a real focus and vision of this development was about how we can make um, active and public transport methods easier, cheaper and faster than what would be the norm, which would be a private vehicle. And we do, and that's been achieved uh, through a community bus service from first occupation. And that's incredibly rare uh, um, in the UK. Often you get extensions to bus loops, um, but they often happen maybe a few hundred, if not a thousand homes down the line. Um, there's really good walking and cycling routes uh, that are segregated and very direct across the site and link into the wider sustainable um, um, transport network across Vista. Um, there's there's a there's a there's a very high percentage of electric charging points. Um, and actually promotion of EVs within the residence is really high with a um, higher than average uptake on this scheme um, than there is across uh, wider Oxfordshire and indeed the wider um, UK. So you can see actually a really nice image there at the bottom um, in the middle of one of those more residential streets that so you've got demarcation of the roads um, um, and um, those types of sort of urban design principles. Next slide, please, James. <coughs> So um, as I mentioned um, there, you can see in the top left, you can see um, a, a sort of more um, aerial view of um, Elmsbrook. On the right hand side there, you can see the UK's first Passive House Plus non-residential building uh, that was uh, led and developed by the local authority, Cherwell District Council, uh, and is actually the home to uh, myself. So I'm not actually there now, I'm at, I'm at my own um, house, but that is where we have a little um, uh, Vista um, office. So it's fantastic to actually have worked on this scheme for sort of over 10 years and actually be located there as well. And I think someone mentioned there about um, home working in one of the questions. So absolutely. So there's super fast broadband to all of the um, homes. Some of the larger dwellings have segregated home um, offices as well. But crucially, this um, sort of eco business centre that you can see there in the top right is a key part of the transport strategy. Um, with this shift of people working more from um, home, but still requiring um, those opportunities to network and meet with um, other individuals, maybe not on a daily basis, they can use this space to either co-work. So there's uh, um, ample amount of um, co-working space. Um, it also runs events. There's a little um, cafe and um, pop up shop in there as well. <coughs> Um, another key part of the um, transport strategy, sorry, James, just pop that one. There we go, um, is that all of the um, homes are within 10 minutes of the sort of key facilities. So all of the homes within 10 minute walk of the, the primary school um, and are all within five minutes of a bus stop as well. As I said, the local centre is on the way. Um, it's just behind that um, behind the business centre. We hope that to be completed by the end of 2022. 
Um, and as I said, around the biodiversity, you can see there at the bottom right, that was actually a fairly sort of um, not very well managed and maintained woodland and little uh, uh, river that f that flowed through there that's actually been enhanced managed specifically for uh wildlife and um has created a lovely little um sort of resting area for um for um residents so there's actually a net biodiversity gain um achieved on that site as well uh next slide please james so <clears throat> just touching uh this is just my last slide uh just touching on some of the key um takeaways so I'm a big advocate of that town wide approach. It's really, really positive and it's really important to show that those ripple effects of new development can be felt within the um, existing town. Sue mentioned um, I'm a director and co-founder of a social um, enterprise called Bistu Green, and that's uh, that's a sustainability and reuse center um, right in the heart of the town of Bista. Um, but that really grew out of the whole eco town vision, and I think that's really important. Again, it's really important to proactively engage with communities and residents and the lead developer on this, um, A2 Dominion and Fabrica, they did, a, they did a lot of work around engaging with local communities around this scheme. I think it's important to say at this scale and at this density, zero carbon development can be done, but there's lots and lots of lessons to be learned. This scheme went through planning in, 20, in 2012, 2013. Would we do things exactly the same way that we did it back then? Absolutely not. But these types of schemes are important to show what can be done. Um, I think it's also important to say that we can reduce car usage in more rural areas, but you have to provide that more holistic approach. It's it's unfair to just put a just to put a bus service in that might run every hour and expect people to use it or 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 expect people to cycle by not providing the cycling um, infrastructure. Um, if I was to point to one area that we can really improve on, I, I would say it's definitely around transport. Landscape really is the primary infrastructure and function um, in the master plan. So by retaining those um, hedgerows, you still retain those green corridors um, and by maintaining them specifically for biodiversity rather than say what a farmer would do, you get really good biodiversity uh, benefits from it. So uh, One Planet Living has really provided the framework and the structure um, so there's a one planet action plan behind those um, um, behind um, Elmsbrook. It really helps to communicate and structure the development's response to sustainability, but crucially shows um, leadership and best practice. And my final point there is um, we've been doing uh, annual monitoring on that scheme for the past three years, and that's absolutely crucial because we, we really have to know what's working and what's not, both in a more sort of quantitative way. So um, are people using less um, energy? Are the solar panels working to their full potential? But also that more qualitative um, um, side of things around the physical and mental um, health. Do people feel better? Are they cycling more? Those types of things. Um, I'm very happy to take some questions um, even now or maybe at the end, Sue, uh, it's entirely up to you. That's great, Lewis. We have we have got a few minutes for questions. Um, so Ruth Lambert was asking about affordability of the homes. So, yeah, that's a, that's a really, really good question, Ruth. So um, um, 30 percent of the homes are what we would classify here in the UK as affordable. So they're a mixture of uh, social rent, intermediate rent and shared um, ownership. Um, but but crucially, those um, but crucially, the houses that are on the market that are, that are market sale, um, they uh, there was an aspiration from the developer and from everyone involved in this scheme that there should not be a sort of green premium att um, um, attached to these um, homes. So um, they are, uh, I would say, they are the because of the high quality of the development and of the homes in the public realm, um, they are at the higher end of the local market, but there is not a substantial percentage increase across sort of other similar developments happening across Bista. Um, uh, that's a good question by Jasmine. Uh, sorry about a retrofitting been necessary for the first homes built on the site to align with the current plans. It's, it's a really good question. Um, the, the short answer is no. The long answer the, or the slightly longer answer is um, learning has happened from the four phases along Elmsbrook. So I'll give you one example is really around um, the solar panels. So on phase one, uh, when they were built in 2015, 
um, the efficiencies of those panels um, were at the top of what was really available um, then um, and the style and the look of them was um, what was available and as the PV market has kind of boomed and matured in the UK the latter the latter phases so phases three and phase four you can see a real difference in the photovoltaics in terms of um, you, you need less panels to achieve the amount of um, peak output and also the look is far more integrated but in terms of sort of retrofitting the home specifically the first homes were always designed to be able to meet zero carbon just like the latter ones as well so it's not like there's a decrease in performance um, and there's just one final question, I think it's from Michael, uh, around post-occupancy. So I think I just touched on that in my last point. So yes, um, we have done three years of post-occupancy on behalf of um, the developer. Um, in terms of what's publicly available, um, I'm not sure. I'll have to sort of dodge that bullet and see what's available um, online. And if we can find it, we can um, we can uh, post that um, maybe in the follow-up email um, but because that was on behalf of the developer um, it's kind of down to them to decide if they want to um, publish it. Um, Lewis, there was yes. um, just just on that point um, a One Planet Living review of Elmsbrook was published post occupancy wasn't it? Would, would, do you think that might be helpful? Uh, yes, yeah, in the chat? yeah absolutely I can I can find that in the next session and post that. And um, my, uh, Andrew Day from Telford Homes was just asking a little bit more about the, you explained a bit about the added value in the sales prices. That's more coming from the quality of the build than a green premium. Mm -hmm. uh, but do you have any information about lower running costs compared to other local new build? Yeah, again, it's it's a really good point and it's kind of the million dollar question. Um, so um, in terms of um, the added value in sales prices i think um one of the things that we've seen here is the quality of the public realm is is so much um, higher in my opinion compared to other local precedents um it feels far more spacious you've got the elements um, you've got a large amount of green space as well um in terms of the running costs um, that's quite a difficult one to sort of really touch on because of um the scheme was not was primarily designed to achieve zero carbon. Um, it's not specifically focused around reducing running costs for the occupants. Um, so um, th there there have been a few um, uh, discussions around the um, heating system. So in this in this development, it's a combined heat and power plant, um, and um, it's. Um, yeah, it's quite a it's quite a sort of controversial topic and conversation specifically around um, the running costs, but it is uh, on par with what a um, what a typical um, gas um, individual uh, scheme would be looking to pay. Um, that I think Sue is probably all I can say on that particular yeah. point. Um, thanks, and I, I would say that in other developments um, where they've, they've taken a different approach. Um, such as at Bedford or One Brighton, running costs are lower in terms of energy and running a car because you can, if you can hire a car and use public transport, it's actually a bit cheaper than owning a car. But as a, uh, generally speaking, and one of the other things too is very much around sort of occupant behaviour as well. So um, we we've done quite a lot of work. Uh, so we've worked with the developer around how these homes should be used. You know, the homes need to be. Uh, use just slightly different to say a typical to a typical house that has a gas boiler and radiators um, and because they're very sort of fabrically efficient you know it's it's very much around sort of occupant behavior and uh, where there are instances of maybe where the house isn't operating in the way that it should often it's not to do with the technology it's to do with how the occupant is using it so I know uh, Fabrica and A2 are sort of very keen to ensure that sort of uh, all the residents are skilled in as much as they can be in sort of how to use um, the dwellings. So we've got a typical one here from Mark. Um, if there's no added value from the green credentials and 40% of the land is used for landscape, is there enough left on the table for the developer? I guess the short answer is yes, um, because they because it's built and it's 
and it's and it's working in that sense um i don't we we're not party to all of the kind of viability um discussions um sort of behind the scenes our role really was as the sustainability champions and coordinators so um yeah I, it's difficult for me to answer um that in detail see thank you i know on other schemes um the fact that it's so for example with our one Brighton scheme, which wasn't a rural scheme, it was the town centre scheme, reducing car parking. So we've got in, a, in an urban setting, you can reduce car parking um, and offer things like car clubs and bring spaces for bicycles. And residents just join in with that if, if you provide it, provided their, their job and their lifestyle supports that. Uh, and that means you can build out more of the scheme, which is an added value in a rural area. Um, I think it needs to be worked out at that Sort of when you're doing your planning application, when you're when you're doing the sort of um, land appraisal for how much you'll pay for the land, you need to factor in uh, the build cost, which may be a little bit extra to do a quality build, versus um, reduced infrastructure like roads um, and car parking, um, and and work the nature in all around. It actually can sell faster, which was one thing we found at uh, the one Brighton development, which is money in the bank that you get your money back faster and you can move on to the next scheme so there's I some think, tips yeah. <laughs> i also think sue one of the key things to recognize here is this is this is um you know this was one of the UK, well it is it is the only eco town being built out um in the sort of original guise back from sort of 2000 and 2008 2009 um and so um it's very much meant to be an exemplar. That's the sole purpose of this scheme. You know, uh, before it was called Elmsbrook, it was very much called the um, exemplar. So it's very much about showing what can be done at that particular time. Um, and I think, you know, we get we get lots of inquiries from other developers coming to sort of visit it and 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 kind of see what's possible. But I think we've learned, yeah, we've learned a lot about, um, you know, what works and what and kind of what doesn't. Yeah, that is a massively important point. So <clears throat> Lewis and the team are working on some developments right now, even more recent than Elmsbrook. And, and the, the difference between, you know, in the cost, of, it's just becoming what you do rather, rather than um, something experimental. And there's a lot of learning there. OK, so moving on. Thanks very much, Lewis. And thanks, everyone, for all the questions. Uh, we will post a bit more in the chat. Moving on now to hear from Joe Pitts Cunningham, who is our One Plant Living lead and supports partners um, in the UK and around the world um, and runs our training programme as well. So over to you, Joe. Thanks, Sue. Um, and lovely to hear from you, Lewis, and from you, Annabelle and Phil also. Um, so we've heard two of two examples of uh, One Planet Living leaders uh, today, Elmsbrook there and Fremantle. And we'd like to introduce and we're really proud to introduce our new Leaders Hub. This is our one stop shop, our central place to showcase all One Planet Living leaders on our website. And um, we've just put a link in the chat. It's fully searchable and filterable, so you can uh, find uh, One Planet Living examples in your area, uh, your region, your sector. Um, there should be something that is applicable um, and it showcases all those great examples some blog posts and lots of information, um, even links to the action plans and their reviews. As I say, a link in the chat, so do have a look around. We're really proud of this new, new site. But uh, what is a One Planet Living Leader? How do you become a leader? Um, next slide. Thank you, James. If you believe your project to be truly ambitious in its sustainability aims, you may wish to apply for leadership recognition. And this is a process by which we review your action plan uh, with a view to helping you to improve it uh, and to, uh, and to uh, increase your aspiration. It's not a certification scheme like LEED, um, or nor is it a tick box exercise. It's a really context specific review of your project and its sustainability aims. Um, recognised projects, once they've been through review uh, and, and are recognised, can use additional logos and branding and get a lot of comm support from us. And we'll obviously put you on our showcase on our, on our leaders hub. As I say, our approach is not a tick box exercise. We consider your contact uh, context and we, we really work as your kind of mentor and coach uh, while we review your action plan and, and try to help you improve it where we can. Who can become a leader? Any built environment project can submit an action plan for, uh, for a re review. Ideally, they want to be using One Planet Living, but if you're not, don't worry too much. We can help you map to the framework. 
what are the benefits? Um, so what is a review? Um, as I say, we're reviewing the whole action plan. Uh, looking through it um, and then uh, helping you to develop uh, uh, and, in, and improve it over over a period. What are the benefits? Entry um, into our network of projects, all as good as the ones you've seen today. And if you've got time later this afternoon and you're in the UK, we've got another webinar with more examples. We've got a platform to showcase your report, your, your work with support from us um, and uh, events like today. Use of the One Planet Living logo um, uh, reserved only for leaders. Additional evidence to show your key stakeholders, including planning authorities and the like, and knowledge that you um, are contributing to solving the biggest challenge that we face, the climate and ecological emergency. Just very quickly, I will just rattle through our process. Um, we need you to create an action plan. We need you ideally to use One Planet Living, but don't worry too much if you don't. You're going to submit that to us and say, we think we are a leader because, and you're, we're going to have a conversation about how why that is and, and, and you're going to explain about your project. We then review all your paperwork. We may do a, a site visit if, if we're able to and we'd like to interview key people in your team, perhaps your CEO or your, or your lead. And then we're going to give you some feedback and we're going to work iteratively with you to try and improve the action plan as much as possible within the bounds of your context. We then suggest a recognition uh, 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 leadership stand, stamp, which will either be leader or global leader, depending on your how high your ambition is. Um, and then from there, uh, the, the real fun starts and we uh, publish your action plan, we publish our review and we start to have a good song and dance about your, your work and about your development. And you get some communication support um, from us to do that. So. That is everything on becoming a, a very quickly, I have to say, on becoming a One Planet Living leader. Um, do get in touch with us. Um, contact details will be at the end of this uh, of this um, uh, presentation. Um, if you have any questions, um, there is a cost associated with becoming a leader, uh, but it's very reasonable. So get in touch and we can discuss how that works. Back to you, Sue, I think. Thanks, Joe. And uh, could you tell us a little bit about the training that we have? On offer. Yeah, of course. I think there's a slide for that. Fantastic. Yes, and yeah. um, we do um, action planning training and this is uh, online training on how to develop an action plan using the framework walks you through the process that we have tried and tested for nearly 20 years. Um, so it's four online sessions, an hour and a half a piece, um, and you can book via our website. We run them roughly every six weeks. Mm -hmm. And as I say, we step through the process that we've taken to uh, to work with uh, organizations and, and develops developments like Helmsbrook and others to create really uh, holistic and bold action plans for sustainability. Um, so yeah, do join that training if you're uh, if you'd like to. And uh, you can find that on our website. In fact, I think every time I go on our website, it pops up and says, do you want to do the training? So <laughs> yes, just go exactly. to our website and you'll find it, byregional.com. Uh, because we want to support everyone everywhere to make this change that we all need to do. And I sometimes think people sometimes say to me, oh, what's it like living in a eco village? Uh, and I say, well, for two weeks it was, um, and I think in terms of also working as a one planet living developer, you know, and at first it's all very exciting and strange, but then it just becomes the new normal. And as Lewis said, uh, and as you heard from Annabelle and Phil, you know, there's a lot of learning there that we're all building on collectively as an industry. And we really want to work with people who really want to do the best and uh, support each other and learn from each other. So I do encourage you to have a look at One Planet Living and uh, join in, whether you're in Australia, the UK or anywhere in the world. Um, thank you very much to the speakers. Um, thank you to Annabelle from Fremantle, uh, to Phil Donaldson from Bioregional Australia. Uh, and uh, to Lewis Knight from uh, Bioregional uh, and to Joe for telling us about uh, how he can or how, how we can support everyone. Uh, there will be a recording available uh, which we will send and we'll send the slides around. There is a second session today at 4 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time in, in the UK time uh, where you'll be able to hear about a One Planet Living Fund uh, in, set up in Canada to fund One Planet Living real estate development uh, from uh, Jonathan Westindy from Windmill Developers. Uh, and no doubt he'll be also talking a, a little bit about some of the projects it's funding. And Springfield Meadows, uh, which is um, an amazing um, community in Oxfordshire uh, that is, is a One Planet Living leader. 
um, and one of the UK's most sustainable developments with a big focus on um, embodied carbon and it's only just being finished so it's a, a very current project. Um, thanks for all your lovely messages everyone, uh, lots of thanks there to the speakers uh, and um, I'll call this uh, webinar to a close, thank you.